and I would like to invite uh, Professor Moran, where uh, he's taking us also to another direction, which is not directly on cyber. Uh, Professor Moran is uh, coming from uh, neuroscience. Uh, always now we need to switch your laptops because you know, no one is allowed to bring his own disk on key and connected and basically our main PC here crashed just in the break. Um, so we will need to overcome this. Um, and also, uh, he holds multiple patents in the area. Uh, what should I say more about you? Everything is there? Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. So, I'm a neuroscientist by training, but I think I'm speaking here uh, on my capacity as a former security person in the tech industry in Israel over 15 years ago. And this is uh, what I, my, by now my uh, fourth time speaking at this conference. I uh, happened to have done my master's thesis with one of the guys who runs this conference, Itzik Ben Israel. So you can see over the years uh, pictures of us as uh, things evolved, but not just our looks evolved, also the topics we speak about. So uh, originally, what is it now, almost uh, five years ago when I spoke here, the topic uh, had to do with how uh, hacking can go beyond just looking at computers, but actually it can get into our bodies. And what would it mean to hack into your insulin pump or defibrillators or even uh, brain devices? A year later, we spoke A year later, we spoke about general ways by which neuroscience is relevant to security. Primarily, um, the idea that all of your passwords, all of your knowledge of security actually resides ultimately in your brain. And given that this is the case, our ability to access your brain and retrieve information from it means that actually there's never a secure security and we are able to get access to your deepest secrets just by getting access to what you hold inside your head and we demonstrated one way to do that but a year later we found a way to resolve that by showing this uh, group in the room a way to create a password that sits in your brain is able to be used to open doors or lock vaults while at the same time not being accessible to you meaning you can use it but you don't know it and when I was asked to speak this year by Itzik about um, to this group, I was wondering what's the next thing. And I think we uh, derived together that the next step would actually be taking it one step above, which is looking at the ways by which something that is even better than our brain can be used for security. Now, this overused picture of uh, machines taking over the world is just symbolically talking us to thinking about AI as not just a tool that will aid us in solving security problems, but also could be a threat to us because it might outsmart us when it comes to security. And I want to start by just convincing you of that. So you're probably familiar with devices like this that are in most of your homes. This is the Roomba and the Nyato, two different devices. And what I want to illustrate with this picture is that while the aim of both those companies and those devices was indeed to clean your house, these two have very different algorithms that operate there. And accordingly, two different images or ideas of what clean means. Now, ultimately, if I asked you what clean means, you probably have an answer. But here you see two different algorithms that embody how cleaning should look and what it should mean. It doesn't just go there. Recently, in more and more buildings in New York, you will see that when you enter the building, there's an elevator. But unlike the majority of the elevators where you go inside and you tap the floor you want to get into, you actually tap the floor on the outside and the elevator decides for you what's the optimal way to take you, which means that when you go inside, you just see an empty panel and you hope that everything works out. And people somehow psychologically freak out because the idea that we're sitting there and there's no controller means that we allocate or outsource our thinking to machines. And now, even though this is the case all the time, we feel helpless seeing that the elevator just takes us places without us having any control. And this is, again, an illustration, but here is where it becomes real. Some of you may know uh, this kind of famous flash crash of 215 uh, symbolic name. It was a, a name given to uh, the biggest crash 
of the New York Stock Exchange ever ha to have happened. This is uh, May 6, 2010, uh, right when the US was coming out of the biggest economic falling of the last 50 years. One day, 2.15 p.m., stocks started to be sold. And then more of them were sold, and more of them, and in the course of about five minutes, $1.1 trillion disappeared out of the US economy. Just to be clear, the US debt to China is $1.2 trillion. So this doubled the US debt in five minutes. It took five more minutes for the same debt to go up, and by 2.30, everything was back in control. But the thing is, humans were just sitting there, seeing the entire economy of the US shattered in front of their eyes and coming back without having anything to do but hesitate to press this one green button that they have there that stops everything from happening. To this date, eight years later, we still have no full understanding of what happened there. But it seems that what happened is that as more and more algorithms are now doing high-frequency trading, AI started to notice changes in trends of selling and buying, and all algorithms who had the same idea of what this could mean started selling their stocks. And for a while, without any human being involved, we lost $1.1 trillion and gained it back because the same algorithms have a faulty safety net. Now, this doesn't end here. We're talking about stock exchange. We spoke about cleaning. It also comes to very basic consumer needs that you all experience. This book, known as The Making of a Fly, is a really, really popular textbook if you study the life of flies. It actually is out of press by now. There's only second editions you can buy in Amazon or other websites. But what's interesting about this book, unlike other books, is that this book, originally priced at $100, at some point, when the year was about to begin and people were about to kind of start studying etymology, was priced on Amazon at $1.7 million. There was only one copy to be sold, and the prices went up and high to $1.7 million. Now, if you were to buy this book at $1.7 million, this would be a bargain, because as soon as the press realized this is the case, there were more and more people flocking into the website to see this thing, and the algorithms realized that people are interested in this book, and the price went up within five minutes to $23 million, plus $3.99 shipping and handling, which essentially would mean that you could make a $6 million bargain just from buying this book that actually no one uses because it's out of press anymore. And what's behind all of that is, again, the idea that algorithms were set to figure out what people want and change the price accordingly, and when algorithms make no sense, or humans make no sense together with them, we see ridiculous events like that. Now, this embodies the fact that at the end of the day, behind AI sits a programmer who had an idea of how the world should work, coded this into the idea, and this is what we see in the algorithm. So maybe the most famous example that by now is not true is one from a uh, Siri circa 2016, where you could go to the uh, phone and tell Siri that you're about to commit suicide, and you're looking for a particular bridge to die for, and Siri would interpret that as a need for a bridge and give you options where to kill yourself. This particular case was uh, pointed out to Apple, and we did within a, a few days, they came up with a uh, fix for that that now tells you that if you ask to commit suicide, it kind of uh, leads you to suicide prevention websites. But the point is this thing happened, we realized how it goes, and then we solved this particular patch. There are probably other ways by which someone who is in despair can ask a question and actually get the answer that you don't want him to get. The correct answer? <laughs> Um, now, it boils down to the fact that uh, over time, we outsource more and more of our thinking to machines. This is a picture of a Tesla factory, and if you look at a Tesla factory right now, what you will notice is that there's no humans involved in this. All you see are machines building a car. In fact, the only reason there's actually a picture to be taken is because someone turned the lights on for the picture, because normally they're actually working in darkness. The joke in Tesla is that a Tesla factory actually has only two entities that uh, are humans involved. One is a human and one is a dog. The human's job is to feed the dog, and the dog's job is to make sure the human doesn't touch anything. And that's the circle <laughs> that happens there. Now, why is, this, why is this ridiculous? Because I think that uh, when we open this talk, 
you heard about uh, the realm of AI taking over our car factories, and it's not a, a, a story that uh, can be taken lightly. There are more and more examples right now of the fact that cars that have AI, simple or complicated ones, human, uh, so entirely self-driving cars, or just self-aided cars, are able to identify problems in humans driving. So we know that the weakest link on driving is actually us humans. Machines, if they drive a car, are much better than us. And as an example, you can see this very famous video of a Tesla car identifying an anomaly in the driver ahead of it and signaling the driver in the car that we're in that an accident is about to happen. So you will now see this video and you will identify the accident seconds before it happens. I hope that the sound's gonna work. Doesn't really work. Okay, what you didn't hear is that there was a, a signal beeping seconds before of the Tesla detection system telling it an accident is about to happen. So, as we look at uh, humans making more and more errors and machines coming to fix them, we can think about the future. And what it seems to be the case is that it's not that we're getting any better. In fact, in the year 2018, there are more humans who are going to die from extreme selfies than from shark attacks. And the reality of the world we live in is that we're uh, more extreme and we use machines not in ways that help us, but actually ways that hurt us. In fact, uh, they're not just hurting us by encouraging us to behave in ways that are harmful, they also hurt us by actually changing our brains. One of the uh, classical examples I like to show in my classes is one of a person sitting and using VR. When he's pushed for a second, he freaks out and it's, of course, ridiculous to see how AI can, can really uh, scare us when it comes to affecting us. But what's behind it, I think, is even more important, is the fact that as we live in a world where we get to experience different experiences through VR, we aren't just watching movies the way we did before, we actually change our brain. So a person that wears VR goggles and experiences the idea of sitting at the top of a building, let's say, and asked to step down, take one step further and actually fall off the building, can do that, not injure him or herself, because it's only a simulation, but his or her brain is now trained that stepping off the ledge of a building actually won't harm you, and in doing so, our brains change. Doing it enough times will make you overcome and override this fear that you internally have of heights, and ultimately make your brain less scared of heights. Concluding this part of just convincing you that AI is a threat in a way and also an opponent to how we think about the world is the fact that there are now more and more examples of how machines can beat us in games where we think we're unique and special. The most extreme example I know of is one that you can try yourself. You can go to the website and type rock, paper, scissors, AI versus humans. And what you will see is a website where you get to play the very basic game rock, paper, scissors against the machine. So you choose paper, rock, or scissor, you throw kind of the choice you make, the machine makes its own choice, and you win some, you tie some, or you lose some. Those are three options. However, this particular website allows you to play the game in two different modes, novice or veteran. And you might ask yourself, what does it mean to play rock, paper, scissor in veteran mode? And the answer is that in veteran mode, the machines aren't just playing randomly against you, they let you play a few rounds, and after round 10, they look at a database full of past games of other humans and try to find a human that played exactly like you. And what they do is they place against you the way they would play against this human. And from then on, you never win. You think you're unique, you think you're random. So you say, I want to do a scissor, so I'm going to actually outsmart my quitter, I'm going to do a rock. And the other guy did the same. And from then on, you can either tie or you can lose. You sometimes actually win if you really are not looking. But for the most part, you basically become a loser in a human game because someone like you exists before, and the database is pretty small. 200,000 people. Just uh, now, this week, in uh, Cannes, in France, they have the uh, biggest advertising conference in the world, the Cannes Lions. Uh, conference, and just yesterday they announced the Clio Award, the winners of the best ad in the world, and the winner of 2018 is a computer. 
So the best ad agency in the world is now a machine that was able to figure out what humans like and what's creative and create the best agency. And what you see here are two poets uh, written by, two poems written, one by a human, one by, by a human poet and one by a machine. And I dare you to kind of see quickly if you can figure out who is the human who is the machine. We're starting to lose in domains that aren't just uh, technological, but also in domains that we defined a few years ago as only humans. So, since we're talking about computer insecurity, I shouldn't just convince you that AI is in your life in that sense, but also that there's actually a reason for security to involve AI right now. And I did that by telling you a few things you should know about humans, coming from my past experience as a computer hacker. So, the first fact about humans, I'm going to give you only three, but there are a lot more, is that uh, for most people in the room, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, but you can just think and kind of look around and see who is getting uh, blushy as I ask that. Most of you use the same password for your email account and your bank account. Most of you use, I see some people nodding their head. I'm willing to uh, gamble. Uh, that does the not, not, I'm willing to gamble on that as well. That, that's the case. And if it's not your email in your bank, then it's your email in your Facebook. And if at some point Facebook is going to force you to change your password, you won't go to all the other accounts and change that. So quickly after, there's going to be a pattern by which I can, if I can hack into one system and another, I can not just learn your passwords, I can actually learn the trend. I can see, okay, every time she uses uh, seven other passwords, three of them are her son's name and the other are her birthday. So soon after, we realized that uh, hackers who got access to some part of you and maybe figured out a way to get into one system because maybe you forgot to lock it properly, usually aren't just done with this one, but they can actually go and walk through the entire variety of options because humans tend to have short-term memory that they can use, short capacity, which ultimately leads to us just using similar patterns or the same identical password in all of them. Humans are also irrational. Uh, we tend to justify to ourselves many of our decisions and when I asked you right now about how many of you have a, the same password in your email and your bank account, many of you said no, not because it's not the case, but because you in your mind said, yeah, right now it's the case, but I'm going to go home and change it. <laughs> right? You kind of tell yourself, well, well, I know that right now, yes, in truthful, it's the case, but since I now remember it's a good idea, I'm going to go home and do it. And this is true for a lot of our choices. We kind of think that we're better than we are. We have different views of who we should be. We, uh, buy clothes for the skinny version of ourselves. We, we go to sleep at midnight thinking tomorrow morning we're going to wake up at 6 a.m. and do our work. And then when we wake up at 6 a.m., we're different people and suddenly we have no idea who the alarm uh, setter was. All of those chances aren't just, just die on our de decisions. They also die when we come to security because we always think we're much more secure than our friend and the average is always the average. And this leads to maybe the third fact that comes from a uh, Back day, the days where I was a hacker, we wrote this big report where we analyzed all of the security threats that we were access to. And I asked my colleagues just a few years ago, so this was now 2016 when I asked them again, what changed? And they keep updating the report and nothing changed. Of, and I know that uh, in this room it might be uh, difficult to fathom statistics because you're in the business of actually providing tools for security. But the reality is that most of the tools that the companies in the room provide aren't going to be helpful as long as humans are involved, because no matter how smart your firewall is, or your VPN, or your uh, sniffer, at the end of the day, your friend just leaves the password in a post-it note on the computer. Or they use, as we said, the same password for all of those things. And the reality is that of the majority of hacks that happened in the last couple of years, when they were analyzed by security teams, it turned out that there was no hack in the sense that we imagine when you see movies of someone kind of trying to brute force password or so on. It was just someone asking someone to give them the password and getting it. So we can put the best locks on our vault, but as long as we keep our windows open, the same problems are there. Okay, so facts about humans, let's talk about facts about AI. AI is a lot better than us in being random. If I ask you to generate passwords, machines are amazing in doing uh, really random passwords. In fact, if you just take a machine and you just have it generate a password, most times it will be a good password for the system without having to ask. If I ask you to generate a password, you will see that mostly you start with a password and it says, no, no, you have to have also a digit. And you try another one with a digit and then you say, no, it has to be eight characters. And you try another. It takes you three or four times to come up with a password for most websites. AI, if you just tell them, create a password, most times they would just get a good password for all websites out there without the need for anything. Because for AI, 10 characters or 20 characters doesn't mean anything. For you, it's the difference between forgetting it and having to write it, 
or having to use your sister, mother, birthday's name to remember it. Also, in a world where we start to outsource security to AI, we need to understand that it would change how security is being done. Right now, it's easy to give machines the ability to actually create passwords, but most websites that ask for passwords also ask a lot of questions that AI has no good answers for, like the mother's maiden name, or AI's favorite car, or the instrument they played in school, and so on. So if we're starting to think of moving the security decisions to machines, it wouldn't just end with actually just having them randomly generate passwords, but also starting to ask different questions so the machines could actually answer those, those, uh, those questions. And importantly, one of the flaws of our thinking is that we constantly think that we're better than them. And yes, if we just make it so that it's a security that's good for us, it's going to work for us. The classical example that I can show you is one where many, many websites in 2010 moved from just regular security to CAPTCHA. It wasn't just security, but you also were asked to show that you are human. I'm losing the system. And it took about six months from the days that this bullet that calls I'm not a robot emerged for is it showing? Let me try again. For robots to for robots to be able to essentially uh, take seconds to figure out how to make sure that they don't figure out robots. This one I like because it doesn't just end with a robot, it also learned to mic drop at the end of uh, the success. Okay, so the point of what I'm trying to say is using uh, Wayne Gretzky's idea that uh, we should skate where the puck is and not just where it is right now. Right now we're in a world where our security is made by humans, used by humans, and hacked by humans. But as we start to outsource this security to AI, we will also need to be better in using the security measures from our perspective. And what I encourage is to actually start thinking also about using cybersecurity from our end, instead of replacing yourself with a machine. So not just have the security team in the room find better ways to sniff the system and figure out who's trying to hack, but also say, you know what, I'm working against machines and they're better than me. What I should do is not even use my own thinking, which is flawed, to put the security, but actually build codes for the secure creation, on my perspective. And effectively, it would mean that the idea that we're heading to is recommended to outsource security to machines because the understanding that we should arrive at is that the weakest link in security right now is the humans. The same way the humans recovered from the uh, crash of 2010 by figuring out the problem and coming up with, humans would, a second later, stop the crash, and in doing so, they would just have us be in a loss of 1.1 trillion that we would not recover from. Giving the machines the ability to fail but also solve it is the solution to this idea. How? So I'm going to give you a few guidelines and one example for that. Step one, instead of just focusing on using AI in securing your, in, in securing your system in the sense of like writing codes, also outsource AIs to create your passwords, to choose which websites and what password logs you're going to be, and what systems you're going to use for your password. Have AI create your security policies in a company. Instead of you deciding what the rules are and then having the AI run, have the AI learn how the traffic goes for a few days, and then suggest for you, I'm going to just go from here, suggest for you what the policies should be. So when you start your company, you just let the sniffer sit in the background, look at the policies, and after a few days, suggest, look, this is the traffic that goes in your system. I advise you to stop this traffic and let this traffic run through. Have AI monitor your generator password, as I said before. Have AI sniff your content, as in, instead of just creating policies that are fixed, and just let him run, the AI should keep constantly looking at your, at, your, at your stream and say, you know what, I realize right now that there's a, an anomaly in your system, and I'm going to update your policies as it goes, rather than have you get an alert and decide as a human what to do. And ultimately, and that's the hardest thing to the people in the room, have AI be the person that vet your CSO, your chief security officer. Right now, at the end of the day, after all is said and done, there's a human being who gets all the feeds and makes a decision, and time and again, Back in the days, we saw that this person, if he or she are the ones making a mistake, then it's going to propagate down the line. So what I suggest, and it's the biggest leap to make, is that maybe the ultimate decider shouldn't be a human anymore, but it should be actually a machine doing that. Now, it's not, a norm, it's not random. There's two examples that I wanted to quickly gloss over in one sentence. Cisco, I learned just this week, is launching now a new system by which they're going to replace 
the alerts of the, uh, the, the uh, encrypted data by having AI learn how data looks when it's encrypted and figure out if there's anomalies in encrypted data. Meaning, rather than doing what you do right now, which is we wait for data to come on our end, be decrypted, figure out what's in it, and then see what was going on, now the AI at Cisco will just sniff the network and learn how to identify packets that look anomalous when they're encrypted. Meaning you will know that something is wrong even though you can't know what's going on inside. Another example from Carnegie Mellon right now is that another thing that we would never think about as security officers was that they realized that as AI was monitoring their security, it could figure out what's going on in the system, not by looking at the traffic at all, but looking at the CPU and listening to its activity and realizing that when the CPU changes in some kind of temperature works at some hours of the day that's not regular, it suggests that there's now an attack. Now, this was not suggested by any humans. No human was thinking, let's look at the CPU and just listen to it and see what's going on. But when the AI was looking at the computer entirely, it realized that there's a different way to look at security. And those are just two examples to suggest that as we go to a world where machines are outsmarting us, allocating and outsourcing your security to machines could be the way to go. And instead of AI being seen as an enemy or a threat to us, it could be harnessed to help us solve problems that humans seem to fail to solve time and again. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Moran. Like always, pleasure to hear you.